God puts closed doors in front of you because he loves you. He wants you to find the open door. Thank you guys so much for being here. It's Labor Day weekend, by the way. Labor Day weekend. Did you guys realize that today 17 million people are deciding to take flights over the Labor Day weekend? 17 million. And you're here. And it's good that you're here. It's good that you're here because as of 8.15 this morning, okay, and it, these numbers have all changed. As of 8.15 this morning, there have been 12,953 flight delays in America over the Labor Day weekend. Almost 13,000. And unfortunately, there's been 717 flight cancellations in America over the Labor Day weekend. That means that there's people that never got where they wanted to go. You guys ever had an experience like that before? You ever had a, who's had a flight experience where your flight got delayed or canceled? Let me just see hands. Just look around, people. This is our support group right here. <laughs> Kim and I, we had one of those moments happen. Um, it was back in, back in July, actually. And in July, man, we were, uh, we were on our way to a wonderful, beautiful excursion and experience in the Mediterranean on a cruise with some friends. Come on, somebody. Who, who would take that right now? Right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, wait till January. It's even better. Um, then you really feel good because then, then you can text your friends. You'd be like, it's so warm here. And they're like, shut up. Right? And so it always feels good. It always feels good. So, yeah, we're, we're on our way. And uh, so we've, we've, we go to Omaha. We spend the night. We got to wake up early, get on the 6 a.m. flight down to Houston. And we take off. And the captain comes on. And he's like, you know, we're going we're gonna to try to get there on time. But there's some weather between us and them. And so we might get delayed. And so I'll come back and let you know. Sure enough. He's right, and we get delayed, and they're out there doing the holding pattern, right? And then we finally get released to come in and to land, and so we land and we're late. Not a problem. Uh, we're still early enough to make my next flight to, uh, to Newark, New Jersey. But that flight keeps getting delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed. And man, now, now we're in trouble because if I don't get out of Houston in time, I don't get to Newark in time to hop on the plane that goes to Greece. Come on, somebody. Greece. That sounds good, doesn't it? So um, we take off finally, and I'm looking at the app, the United Airlines app, all right? I'm looking at it, and I'm saying to myself, I'm looking at the time, and I'm going, this is going to be tight. Like, we, we, may, we may get there in time. I don't know. And sure enough, man, we're coming in, and we're landing, and we're taxiing to our gate, and I get a notification on my app that the plane to, to Greece, which there's only one a day, by the way, United goes from New Jersey to this place, in, or Athens, Greece, where, we, where it needed to be. They go, they do one a day, and they pushed off from the gate, and that flight left, and all of a sudden my app goes, your flight has been canceled. And then it comes back and it goes, and you've been rebooked. Now, I'm not just going over just to, like, be there. I, I'm, we're going to be there hanging out on beaches, but we're going to be on a cruise. Like, I got to get there. Like, this cruise is going to leave. It leaves with or without you, by the way, right? And so United in their genius efforts to satisfy the customer, has now rebooked me to Greece, but they can't get me there tomorrow. It's going to be two days from now. Two days. I I'm in the New Jersey airport now. I am stuck in the New Jersey airport, right? I mean, of all places, that's, n that's not really, really the place that I was dreaming of taking a vacation to, right? I'm just saying. And so, so here I am. And so I'm like, okay, hey, it's not a problem. Not a problem. I, I can fix this. I can fix this. So I'm in the airport. I get on my phone and I call United. I'm talking to one of the representatives. And I'm, I'm trying to help the representative because I travel enough that I, have some, I, I know some things. So I'm talking to her and we're trying to get this thing figured out. It's an hour-long conversation. It actually ends up being about an hour and seven minutes. Okay? Yeah, yeah. I took a picture of that one. All right, like, that was worthy. An hour and like seven minutes, and uh, we're having a hard time because why? You're in July. A lot of people travel in July. Uh, number two, um, they're trying to book and pack flights, and you guys know already, they don't just try to pack that, they try to overfill that flight, right? And then when you're working on an international flight, you have to work with the international partners with United, and you've got to try to, you know, get a seat with one of them as well um, if United can't get you where you're going to go. And so those guys, they don't release seats at the last minute. 
And so nothing, man, nothing's happening, nothing's happening. Uh, um, uh, an hour and seven minutes into it, and the, and the lady says, Mr. Baker, I think I got something for you. The flight leaves in 45 minutes. You're in Terminal A. You need to get to Terminal C. Okay? And I'm like, okay, all right. Uh, we can do this. Thank you so much. This is going to be awesome. And we're making our way from Terminal A to Terminal C for this international flight. And I'm trying to check in with my app, and I can't get the boarding passes. And to get on this flight, I'm going to have to go back through security again. But you can't go through security unless you have the boarding pass. So I was just like, okay, i got to get this thing. So I go up to the United counter when I get to Terminal C, and the lady looks at me and she says, sir, I'm sorry, um, we're, we're going to have to rebook you. There's no way I can get you on this flight. This flight leaves in 25 minutes. And um, you're, you got here too late. I'm like, I got here too late. Like, United gave me the ticket. Like, I'm here on orders of United Airlines. Right? Like, let me on this flight. And she basically just says to me, like, I'm sorry, but you, you're not getting on this flight. You're going to have to rebook. And man, I'll tell you what. I am like, my blood pressure went from here to there somewhere. You guys know what I'm talking about? You guys ever have those moments where, like, I don't cuss, but I do, I do use Christian cuss words. You know Christian cuss words like, doggone it, like what in the world, like what the thunder, like any of that kind of stuff is just Christian cuss words, all right? I'm just going to tell you right now, all right? And so that's where your pastor's at right now, all right? It was a beautiful sight. You guys would have loved to have been there with your phone, getting it on video, because then you could hold it over my head. Like, I am like up to there. Like, I am on fire, man. I can't believe this. Like, my wife, is, she's planned all of this, right? And I mean, look, she went all in, guys. Like the suitcase, we borrowed a suitcase from a friend because we didn't have a suitcase big enough for the excursion. I'm thinking to myself, the excursion is to the beach. How about a swimsuit and a t-shirt, somebody? No, this thing's like a mini coffin. Um, I think there's somebody actually living in there. Um, they're charging rent to them. But I mean, I mean, the wheels, you try to roll this thing and the wheels are screaming back at you like, I don't want to go. Like, the wheels on the suitcase don't even like how much weight is in this thing. It takes two people to lift it, all right? So I'm just saying, like, we really wanted to go on this thing. And now we are sitting on cold concrete in New Jersey. Because we're, we're sitting at the part of the airport where you bring your bags to check in. You know that part? Because that, that part doesn't have restaurants. That part doesn't have the, the coffee shops. Not where we were at. There's no restaurant, no coffee shops right? There's nothing, there's no chairs. There's cold concrete, and we're sitting on it. And I'm back on the phone with United. Uh, um, you guys royally, like, screwed this one up. So we've got to fix this, and we got to fix it now. My wife is sitting next to me, and she's not happy, right? <laughs> like, that's, that's just what you do, right? This is what you do. It's not true. My wife's over there. She's smiley. She's all happy. My, my wife's amazing in moments like this, right? She's amazing in moments like this. I'm the disaster, all right? Um, and so, in, anyways, I'm sitting on the cold concrete, and I'm on the phone with them, and then out, again, an hour-long conversation. I mean, we're, look, we're trying to save the vacation, guys. An hour-long conversation, and finally the lady says to me, sir, I'm sorry. There is no way I can get you there in time for your cruise. So the next words my wife hears is this, just cancel the flight. We'll, and, and we're going to cancel the cruise. <laughs> and that's what we do. So now I'm sitting on cold concrete in New Jersey with no plans, with no flight, and, and by the way, no bags either. So now I have to go down to the baggage claim department and tell them, hey, here's my two tickets. I have two bags, one of which I don't even want. Um, it's too big, <laughs> right? But I, I got two bags. It takes two hours to get the bags. I don't know if you've hung out in the carousel luggage area, you know, very long, but there's no seats in the carousel luggage area, right? It's all meant for you to get your bag and get on with yourself, right? So we're sitting on cold concrete in New Jersey again for two hours waiting for that bag. We finally get that bag. We hop in an Uber and we get our way to the hotel. And, um, oh, by the way, United paid for the hotel. Wasn't that nice of them? So we're in the hotel, and then we come down to the restaurant because we haven't eaten. We started at 6 o'clock in the morning in Omaha. It's now 10 o'clock at night in New Jersey, and we're eating some food, and I just simply look at my wife, and I say, honey, what do you want to do? Do you want to go home 
or do you want to go do something else? She's like, well, if we did something else, what will we do? And I was like, well, we're already on the East Coast. My parents live in Florida. What if we just go down to Florida and hang out with my parents for a couple of days? And she's like, oh, wow, could we do that? And I go, well, why don't you call my parents and see if we can come? <laughs> so Kim, Kim calls my parents to see if we can go. I get on the app. Again, it's very painful at this moment, but I get on the United app to see if there's any tickets. And sure enough, there's two, there's two tickets, and we buy the two tickets, and my parents say yes. And so uh, we sleep. The next morning, we wake up, and we're excited, right? But there's a little bit of excitement. We're still kind of on this, like, ah, man, we don't get to go where we want to go. But we got a little excitement. We're going to go do something. And we flip the news on, and what's happening that day? The computer crisis crash of all the airlines is happening that day. And now I'm stuck in New Jersey? That's not happening. So I told, I told Kim, like, let's hurry up, get ready. Like, we're going to the airport now. And so we got there, like, super early. We get all checked in. And um, then all of a sudden, they go, hey, your flight's going to be taking off on time, by the way, at gate, like, A24. Because we're back in the A concourse. There was a PTSD right there. I was going to tell you that right now. <laughs> right? We're back in the A concourse, and we're at A24, and there's all these people standing around because on the sign, it says this, the flight's going to Minneapolis. That's not where I'm going, folks. I'm going to Southeast Florida, right? And so everyone's standing around. Everybody's confused. No one knows what's going on. And then all of a sudden, phones all over the place. Bling, 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 bling. You see people like pulling their phone out and they're looking at it. And then this whole herd, kind of like Charlie Brown, okay? When the Charlie Brown cartoons when they played football. And the ball went there and all you saw was this like dust bowl. And then the ball went there. All right? All of a sudden, in the Newark airport, A24, everyone's moving to A27. No joke. It was just like that. It was like a herd of people. And we're all sitting, and we're there, and people are starting to line back up, and we're at 827, and then bling, 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 bling. Everybody to 829. Everybody to 824. Everybody to 827. Back to 829. Is that true? Finally, we took off. It was a miracle. Um, I have no idea what happened there, but we get there, it's late. It's like, let's just get a little bit of food and let's go to sleep. That took all day. I was supposed to get there around noon. I took all day. We get there, we eat some dinner. And then I'm in my parents' house and I go to sleep. I wake up the next morning. I get a cup of coffee. I'm sitting in the living room, drinking some coffee, looking at flights reading about people's horror stories of their flights being canceled and they're you know, like all over the world, you know, stuck. And I'm drinking my cup of coffee and my parents are in the kitchen and they're talking and then all of a sudden, my mom says, Jeff, you need to get in here right now. Something's not right with your father. And I go walking into the kitchen and my dad has his hands on two sides of a counter, his head's kind of down, and I go, well, what's the deal? And he tries to talk, but he can't formulate all of the words. He, he was normal. Just like earlier, when he came out of his bedroom, we talked, and everything was great. And now he can't say certain words, and he can't formulate certain sentences. And he, he's kind of confused, and he doesn't know. So I, I get him, and I walk him back over into the living room. I sit him down on the couch, and I start asking him a couple of questions really quick. And I, and I quickly discover, yeah, man, whoa, wow, we've got a serious problem. And we lay hands on my father, and we pray for him in Jesus' name that God would heal him. And immediately after that, I say, let's take him to the emergency room right now. Let's go. And so my mom goes, well, he uses the VA, and the, the hospital's 30 minutes away up in West Palm. And I go, well, I, look, I use the VA. That's my primary source. And so we're not taking him up there. That's too long. We don't have that kind of time. We need to get him to a closer VA, of which my mom said, well, you know, look, we, we, he uses the VA. So, I mean, are we going to be able to, like, what about, can we afford that? I go, look. I'm just telling you, they're going to take him into any, any emergency room. So I was there, had this knowledge. We get my dad in the car. Five minutes later, we're at the emergency room, and they're checking him in, right? And they're finding out what's going on, and they get him back into the back. And then quickly after that, they're moving him into the neurological ICU. At this particular hospital, they had multiple different types of ICUs. One of them was for obviously this brain and nerve trauma, neurological ICU, and they get him into there. And my dad is there for like four days while I am in Florida 
That's when I realized, guys, it wasn't United that canceled my flight. It wasn't United Airlines that canceled my cruise. It was God himself at work putting me right where I needed to be, right at the very moment I needed to be there. Four days later, my dad gets out. It's like as if nothing happened. Like if you met my dad today, you would talk with him, and it was as if like no stroke ever took place in his body. He's back to golfing, the whole works. I took that picture just to make sure everybody knew. He's alive. He's okay. All right? He's giving the nurses about a lot of fit. He's telling a lot of jokes. Right? But that's when I realized, guys, God, you were in the midst of this. You were the one directing my steps. This happens for us all the time. So I'm here today not to tell you a story of my travel woes. I'm here to tell you a principle about God. Here's the principle. I'm here to tell you today that Proverbs 16.9 is true. Here's what it says. We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. Come on, somebody. Like, you see what I'm saying? We made our plans. My wife and I, we made our plans. But my plans, they don't, they're not more important than God's de determination of my steps. And for your life as well. Like, this is where we live. We live in this world where we make plans, which we ought to make plans. But we have to realize that our plans are need to be held like this. Because God determining my steps of where I go is always going to put me in a better place. So your plans are not always going to work out. But what you have to come to the conclusion on is that God's determining of your steps are always better. Here's the reason why. One of the things God's doing in determining your steps is he's protecting you from you. Like, we like to blame a lot of things on the enemy, but let me tell you your worst enemy, you. And many times he's protecting you from you. Why? Because we dream all of these thoughts and we have all of these unmet expectations and we have all of these desires that are not even what God wants for our life. And when God closes these doors, when God says, your plans are not going to happen, instead of getting ticked off and mad at God, where our hearts should go is say, okay, well then God, what in the world's going on? Can I just say this to you? I didn't, I didn't learn that lesson until after that vacation. Like, look, well, follow this. When I'm the lead pastor of this church and managing this church, there is an increased sensitivity in my heart. Why? Because I know that I'm in a seat of ministry. And there is a great responsibility. Can I just say this to you? That when I went on vacation, I kind of, I, I realize now, I checked out of that. I kind of went on Jeff mode. I'm like, I'm on vacation. Like, okay, when I'm in ministry and when I'm in this seat, yeah, God, I am super sensitive. But when I went on vacation, I checked out of that and went on to Jeff mode. And that's why I'm standing at the counter and I'm upset and I'm ticked off and my blood pressure's through the roof. I'm not on, Holy Spirit, how are you leading and guiding me? I'm over here on Jeff mode. Can I just say this to you? We don't ever get a check out of, Holy Spirit, you're leading and guiding me. Because when you do, you'll always be disappointed in yourself. Take it from me. You see what I'm saying? Like, it's a difficult spot to be in. So here's what we have to do. We got to fight to stay in the attitude of the Holy Spirit, you're leading me and you're guiding me all the days and all the minutes of my life, whether I'm going on vacation or I'm drumming up the next biggest deal that's going to make an impact for your kingdom. It, it doesn't matter where you're at or what end of the spectrum you are in. When you're making your plans, whatever plans those are, we need to understand that, God, you're the one who is leading my steps. And guys, sometimes when your plans don't work out, you don't always know why they don't work out. Sometimes it takes a year later before you really ever discover. Have you ever had those moments where I had a plan, I wanted to do something, but a year later you discovered, wow, I'm really glad that didn't work out. And God, you had something better for me? See, for me, it was 24 hours later. What kind of faith does that take? It takes no faith 24 hours later to discover, oh, I see, God, why you closed the door. I'm not standing up here as some kind of man of great faith in front of you right now. I'm standing up here as a man that's telling you about my travel woes that discovered a spiritual weakness in me. And I don't want that spiritual weakness in me, right? 
So I'm not standing up here trying to proclaim I'm some like great dynamic spiritual leader in this moment. No, I failed in this moment, but I'm failing forward. I'm failing forward. I'm recognizing, like, look, don't be so quick to check out of Holy Spirit, you're leading me, even if you're on vacation. Okay, are you with me on that? All right, here's, here's another one. I'm also here to tell you today that this, this is true. Revelation 3, 7. Listen to what God says about himself. He says, what he opens, no one can close. And what he closes, no one can open. This is a requote from the Old Testament in Isaiah. But look at what it says about God. When God closes a door, when God closes an opportunity, he closed Greece on me, right? He closed the cruise on me. That's closed. No matter what I did, no matter how many phone calls I made, no matter how upset I got, no matter how many solutions I could come up with, I'm not going to kick open a door if God closed it. Because if God closed it, it's closed. But if God opened one, then nobody can ever close it either. Have you ever found yourself in a place where you've been banging your head against a closed door from God? only to be frustrated, upset, your faith is challenged, it's a season of life that you just don't even want to be in? Have you ever found yourself in a place where you're banging your head against something and you're wondering, why can't I make this happen? I, I, know, I always make this happen. Like, why, why can't I go here? Why, why, why do I have oppos- opposition? Why all of a sudden, when I made all these plans, now I don't even have the money to follow through with it? Why is it that this business deal is going south? Why is this partnership falling apart? Like, Have you ever found yourself in a spot where the door is closed and no matter what you do, you can't open it? Because if you have, you know the frustration. But what you have to realize is that God closes doors so that you will find his open door. Can I just say this to you in life? That in life, here's what you're going to discover in your spiritual journey, trying to know and hear the voice of God and follow his promptings. What you're going to discover is that you're going to run into more closed doors than you run into open doors. Closed doors, they they do something in us. They, They test our obedience to God. They test our sensitivity to hearing his voice. Do you realize that in life, if all you ever discovered was open door, open door, open door, open door, you would never even be asking the questions, why? You would never ask the question, why? Like, why, God? Why, why the pain? Why the sorrow? Why the difficulty? Why the challenge? Why am I doubting myself? Why am I going through this depression? Like, why? Like, and when you ask the question, why, to God, did you realize that's probably one of the most spiritual questions you could ask? Because now your heart is in a position to hear. Most of our interaction with God is telling him what I want, telling him what I need. God wants you to be in a position where you are open to listening to what he wants to share. So the most spiritual question you could probably be asking is the question of why. Why, God? Why is the door closed? Why is this opposition facing me right now? And by the way, here's what we tend to do. When we don't get our way, when we push against something, we don't get our way, what we tend to do is become quick. We do this quickly. We become spiritual toddlers in the wisdom of an almighty God. We throw our tantrum. We drop to the ground. Like we're like, no, man, I can't believe God, you're so mean. You, I can't believe you would do this. Like I deserve this. Like I need this. Like This is what's best for me. It's like a toddler on earth doing the, you know, you know, toddlers throw their little fits and it's kind of like, <laughs> you'll learn someday. That's who we are spiritually. We throw our little toddler fit and God's like, in my wisdom, I'm telling you, you don't want to go through this door. You can bang your head against it all you want, but I'm not letting you go through this door. Why? Because I love you. I love you. God puts closed doors in front of you. Because he loves you. He wants you to find the open door. Now, this is not a sermon just about me and my experience. It's not even about these two scriptures. Because what I experienced and what you experienced and what these two scriptures are telling us, the Apostle Paul actually experienced it in real life. It's found in Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 9. Take a look at his experience. It's very similar. It says, next, Paul and Silas, they were going on their second missionary journey. They traveled through an area of Pergia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. Did you, I mean, before we even keep reading, just pause for a second. They are going through this area because they came against a closed door. I'm going on vacation 
I got a closed door. That seems very minor compared to Paul going, I want to go preach in Asia. Meaning, I want to get up in front of a bunch of people and tell them about the good news of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit goes, nope, closed door. You don't get to go there. I know that was your plans. I know it's what you thought was best. But it's not what I want for you. So closed door. So what does Paul do? Well, watch what he does in verse 7. So he keeps moving on, right? Then coming to the borders of Mycia, they headed north to the province of Bithynia. But again, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. So he goes, oh, oh, okay, well, if I can't go there, then, man, I have a passion. I'm going to preach this. Like, I got to get out there. I got to do something. So he decides, okay, well, if that door's closed, let me journey this way. And he journeys this way. And he discovers, oh, there's a closed door. I can't go there either. Like, I'm just wanting to preach the good news here, Lord. I'm on a missionary journey. I've raised missionary monies. I'm out here. People are expecting me to, you know, start new churches, encourage believers. They're in, they're, this is what they want me to do. But you won't let me. So what does he do? Does he quit? Does he throw, that, throw his tools in? Does he, you know, just pack up his bags? Does he just check into a hotel in some little village and go, well, you aren't going to let me go. Well, then I'm not going. No, that's not what he does. In verse 8, he says, so instead, they went on. He continues on. He just stays engaged. He goes on through Mycia to the seaport of Troas. Watch what happens. That night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece. Seriously? Like, it's a little, it's a little personal right now. All right? A man from Macedonia in northern Greece, of all, of all places, was standing there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. Meaning, come over and share the good news of Jesus with us. So Paul isn't allowed to go to Asia and preach. He isn't allowed to go to Bithynia and preach. So he just, he just keeps going, right? He doesn't give up. He keeps pressing in. Right? He just keeps going, and God brings him to Troas, and God gives him a dream. He doesn't even get to Troas and preach, by the way. He's in Troas. Here's the ministry that happens. is what God wants to do to him. You do realize that in this life, it's always more about what God wants to do in you than what God wants to do through you. And here's a perfect moment of it. It's less. I didn't bring you to Troas to preach, Paul. I know you can do that. I didn't bring you there to start a church. I know you can do that. No, I brought you here, and you're going to sleep. I'm going to give you a dream, and the next day you're going to hop on a ship, and you're going to go over to northern Greece, and you're going to preach there, and I'm going to do something that's going to blow your mind away. So Paul doesn't quit. He doesn't complain. He just keeps moving, and here's what he does. He makes himself available for wherever God wants to lead him. So in wrapping up this message, two questions that you probably are asking, you've asked yourself, or you're soon going to be asking what do you do when your plans aren't working? What do you do? What do you do when your plans aren't working? And what do you do when the door ahead of you isn't opening? What do you do? I think the Apostle Paul has got some great life illustrations for us. When your plans aren't working and the doors ahead of you are not opening, don't quit or doubt God. Apostle Paul, he doesn't quit. He doesn't doubt God. He doesn't just throw in the towel. He doesn't go, well, man, it's frustrating. Like, I'm bringing Silas along. I'm trying to teach this guy what it means to, like, listen to the voice of God. And, God, you're playing games with me. Like, I'm just throwing the towel in. Like, don't play games with me, God. No, he doesn't do that. He doesn't get arrogant about it. He doesn't start doubting the goodness of God. He doesn't start doubting that God loves him. He doesn't start doubting that he, he's hearing the voice of God. No, he just recognizes, this was my plan, it didn't work. This was my plan, it didn't work. Oh, this is your plan. So he doesn't quit. He doesn't doubt. Don't doubt God because your plans aren't working. Don't doubt God because you keep banging your head up against a closed door. Look for the open door. Keep, keep moving forward. This is the first thing that you see him doing. The next thing is this. you got to hold on to faith and you got to keep seeking God. When the doors aren't opening and your plans aren't working, like hold on to faith and keep seeking God. This is what Paul did. He was a master at it. He, he led his life like this. This is my life, God. Where do you want to take it? Oh, it's not there? Okay, oh, I'll go. No, it's not there? Oh, it's not there? Oh, it's here? Okay, here's where I'll flourish. 
Here's what we do. This is my life, God, and this is what I want you to do with it. Anytime you come to God with this is my life and this is what I want you to do with it, let me just say this to you. You're more often to run into the brick wall than ever before. When you live your life like this, this is my life, what do you want to do with it? You might run into a closed door that teaches you. It teaches you to have the conviction of the voice of the Lord. It teaches you to have like the, the stamina spiritually to keep moving forward. And so you go over here and you run into that closed door and it teaches you obedience. And it teaches you a greater sensitivity to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And then you move over here and God goes, yes. And you flourish there. You're just willing to give yourself. So you got to stay faithful. you got to stay faithful and you got to keep seeking God. What do you got for me? What do you have for me? This plan's not working. Instead of getting frustrated like I did in the airport, let's be more like Paul. And let's go, okay, if this is not what you have for me, I'm going to move to here. Like, how, I'm gonna just going to do something for you. I'm going to keep honoring you. I'm going to keep glorifying you. So just keep making yourself available for wherever God wants to lead you. Can we just all agree that you can make your plans, right? But if God's determining your steps, wherever he's taking you is going to be better than what your plans are going to be. Can we, just, can we just all agree to that? Can we all agree to the fact that we are like toddlers in the wisdom of an almighty God? And that the wisdom of an almighty God is what we should pursue for the next step of our life? Can we all agree to that? Can we all agree to this simple principle that whether you are teaching a, a class for children on who is Jesus, or you are going on vacation to Greece, that in both of those situations, the same Holy Spirit is wanting to lead and guide your life? Can we just all agree to that? Can we all agree to be people that are just going, let's just be more sensitive to the Lord. And when my plans aren't working, I'm not going to doubt him. When my plans aren't working and the door's closed in front of me, I, I'm, I'm not going to get like, ticked off and frustrated at God. Okay, I, I might stumble and fall and get ticked off and frustrated at systems and structures and people on this earth. But when I, when I come to the rec recognition that, God, you're closing that door because you want me in Florida to be there with my father in a very, you know, trauma-driven moment so I can keep my cool and I can step in and I can help and I can give guidance and I can give direction and I can be there as the oldest son of the family? Can we just admit that, okay, I need to repent of the past? I need to repent. And can I just bring you and give you glory and say, God, thank you that you canceled my plans so I could walk in your steps? Can we just be those people? Let's, let's strive to be those people. Amen?